And he realized that, you know, I, I hadn't swallowed a whole bottle of bourbon or something, and that I was having a seizure. So he slung me in his car and took me to the hospital, and they came up to my room looking all terribly doctorish and somber, and they said, Elizabeth, you have a brain tumor, and you've had a seizure. Were you terrified? I was stunned. It's like, I said, where is the tumor? And they said, this side of your head. And I said, well, how, how big is it? And they said, about two and a half inches, uh, thickness of a golf ball. And I said, well, I don't particularly want that. Did you know when you went into the operating room that it was going to be benign? They, because of the positioning of it, uh, kind of thought that it would be benign. And when they cut it out, and I came to, and I had this shaved head with a little tiny stubble of snow white hair coming in. It was, it was a giggle, but the scar was seven inches long. Could you really giggle? I mean... Yeah, well, yeah, it was funny. I mean, I looked funny. And I always wondered, Oh, what kind of shaped head I had. <laughs> I wondered whether I had like a flat egg, you know, like a pillow ahead in the back. And I said, oh, can I see what the back of my head looks like? Were you pleased at least? <laughs> yes, I have a round <laughs> head. It wasn't like an egg head at all. You are amazing that you can laugh at this. What else are you going to do? How risky was this operation? I think any operation probably on the brain is risky. But I came out of it fine. Uh, came home like a week later, had another seizure. Have you had other seizures since then? No, thank God. They've got me on medication um, daily. If I didn't have that medication, I probably would. They started playing around with different kinds of medications, and some of them uh, really disagreed with me. I had 17 falls. I broke ribs. I broke my ankle. Is there any danger that this tumor can come back? I'll smack the hell of it if it does. <laughs> you have reportedly had about 40 surgeries, so many illnesses. Do you think that any of the illnesses go back to your childhood? No. You know, it's very hard to sort of analyze something, but uh, a few years back, Oprah uh, was uh, interviewing Michael Jackson, and you came on that program. And at one point, you said that you and Michael Jackson had so much in common, in particular because you both had abusive fathers. Do you remember saying that? Yeah. You've never talked about that. No, it, it just popped out of my mouth. I don't talk about it. But uh, when I was a, a little girl, um, my father was abusive when he drank. And uh, seemed to kind of like to bat me around a bit. But when I left home and had my own child, I started thinking about my father and how it must have felt for him to have his nine-year-old daughter making more money than he was, all of a sudden shoot to fame when he had been this very proud, beautiful, dignified man. I really don't wonder, and I don't blame him at all. I know he was drunk when he did it. I know he didn't mean to do it. He didn't know what he was doing. Any lasting effects of that abuse on you? No, I called him and said, Dad, can you come up to the house? And we went into the kitchen and I sat on his lap 
and I put my arms around him and buried my head in his neck, and we both sobbed. This is when you were a good deal older. Uh, about 21. Mm -hmm. And we bonded for the first time since I was like nine. And it was until he died. It was like that. You've had so much happen to you just in the last two years. I mean, the fall, the fractured your back. After your fall, when you were in such pain, you stayed in your bed for weeks and weeks, years almost at a time, didn't you? I did not want to leave my bedroom. I just didn't want to go out. When did you begin to sort of come back to yourself again? Oh, God, I don't know. It's been several months now. Rod Steiger really helped me because he had been through that depression. I really think he just saved my life. I know that sounds corny, but he certainly got me out of the doldrums. I was stuck out at sea without any wind. Elizabeth, while we're talking about your health, I don't think most people realize um, what good shape you're in, how quickly you can walk. I know this is a very deep chair, but, you know, let's, let's see you get up and move a little. Okay. Oh, good. Wow. <laughs> okay, come back. We have to finish this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down and behave yourself now. We have okay. more to go. Okay. <laughs> You know, when we talked two years ago, you said that you didn't think that anyone would ever hire you again for a film. And was I right? Do you have not received any offers? They're scared to insure me. I finally found out. Do you want to work? That made me want to work. It was like putting a red flag in front of a bull. You'd like to do a film? Now that they tell me I can, I yeah. <laughs> Just as you were beginning to feel good again, then your former husband, Larry Potensky, f falls, the, the, the rumor is, or the report was that he was drinking. How is he? I've spoken to him on the phone. He sounds much improved to what, con considering what happened to him. Uh, he doesn't remember what happened. Do you think he'll be all right? I do. You know, he's your ex-husband. When we talked last, he was wanting a lot of money from you. But you were heartsick over his accident. Really worried and really caring. No, yeah. no, no, no remnant of bitterness. You can't be with somebody for like eight years and have loved them and shared life with them and just have it disappear like turning off a faucet. Some people do. Well, I can't. If I love somebody, I love them always. You have said that Mike Todd and Richard Burton were the great loves of your life. Is there room now for another love? Oh, I don't know, but if it came along and slapped me in the face, I certainly wouldn't push it away. There are rumors that Rod Steiger is more than just a friend with you. No, we really are friends. No romance? No. What about marriage? If you fell in love, oh, look, your whole face changes. No marriage. <laughs> uh -huh, that's my answer. Yes. <laughs> no marriage ever, no matter what. No! Okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Deep down, is there anything that you still long for? Oh, just to go on feeling good and healthy and to be able to do constructive things, to be able to do things for AIDS, that, like getting my ass out of this house and going to New York or going to Texas or whatever I have to do to raise money. I would give up movies, 
in a second to be healthy enough and well enough to work for AIDS. While you were spending so much time uh, in your bedroom, your good friend Carol Bayer Sager gave you a tape recorder and said, here, talk into this, do your autobiography. Are you, Are you going to do an autobiography? I'm too lazy. Oh, Elizabeth, everybody's written about you. Why don't you write about you? Because, Barbara, I don't want to delve into the past. I am so much into today and what's happening to me today. It's like every day that I am alive and feel this sense of joy. It's a miracle. Why would I want to go back into times that were sad or tragic or joyous but gone? Why would I want to do that? Have you ever thought of what you wanted on your tombstone? Here lies Liz. She lived. No, I don't like Liz. I hate that name. Well? Here lies Elizabeth. She hated being called Liz. <laughs> <laughs> but she lived. <laughs>